Alright, good morning Earthlings. How you doing? Welcome back to First Contact Radio. You ready to go? See what we got to deal with today? Alright, cosmic weather first. Cosmic weather, for those of you new, compilation of what the energy is we're dealing with today. Makes It's made up a lot of different elements, from astrology to the actual weather that's going on from the planets and stars to the Mayan cosmology and so on. So, let's get to it. You'll figure it out as we go along. You'll understand anyway what I'm talking about. First thing we do is solar wind. Solar wind is at 399.5 kilometers per second. 5 kilometers per second, so it's moving at a pretty good pace. Our planetary K index is at a 1. However, we can possibly jump up to a 4 in the next 24 hours. And this is a scale of 1 through 9, so just to have a point of reference, planetary or uh, any kind of coronal holes, nothing really much. I got a little bit of stuff right here, but certainly not anything significant like we've had in the past. And I'm wondering where that big triangle is. Maybe it's on the other side right now. All right, our M class flares have dropped 15% chance, 1% for X class. We're still at 20% active for. Uh, flares or uh, geomagnetic storms in the mid latitudes and if you're in the upper latitudes you do have about a 30 percent chance of having some sort of activity so it's a good time for uh, cameras and stuff like that all right and I believe we can move on from here astrologically okay we're dealing with the Sun sign of Leo Leo is a fire sign so with fire signs element of fire. Fire represents ideas. In the tarot cards it would be the suit of wands. Ideas, uh, creativity. So we've been dealing with Leo the lion. That's been the sign. Our conscious mind is the represented by the sun sign. So with Leo our conscious mind is represented by fire. So all this last month that we've been in the phase of Leo we're working with these energies, a lot of ideas and creativity, how to put it to use. But it's bubbling up. And the idea behind Leo the Lion <clears throat> in the tarot cards, you have the tarot card of strength, which would be Leo the Lion. And it represents righteousness. But righteousness, if you break the word down to right useness, it's the right useness of the energy. And the whole idea is you want to take all of this energy that we have channel it up as like the, it's the kundalini energy. Let this energy channel up through the heart and as it comes through the heart the right useness of the energy is to channel it all through love and if you do that first and foremost that will be your greatest strength because that is one of the the gifts spirit has provided. Love is one of the greatest strengths we have and when we learn to use it it becomes something very powerful for us to uh, help eradicate evil and darkness from the world. So that's one good thing about it. Now, unconsciously, we are right here today. Today we're on the 8th. So the unconscious is represented by the moon phase. The moon phase today is between two different signs, between Aries and Taurus. When it's between two signs, it's called void, of course. And it's a phase where there's still kind of indecision about what's going on because there's a decision of which one of these signs do we go with. We're leaving the one going into the other. Well, Aries is fire and Taurus is earth. So the two elements we're looking at and concerned with are earth and, and fire, how they're going to interact together as they're making the changing of the guard. And the changing of the guard is going from fire to earth. So how is the fire going to translate into the earth? Earth is like practicality. Earth is represented by the things that we create and manifest down in this planet. So we've got ideas on the outside, and then we've got ideas and creativity and pioneering efforts, which is Aries, which is now translating into something practical. And all of this is coming about as we are going out of the Mercury retrograde phase into a bit more clarity of focus now. Now the Mercury is going direct. So all of these energies are moving to a more practical use of our, our creativity and ideas as we move forward. So that's uh what's going on today our moon phase we're 61 percent of the way full 
We're in the waning phase, which means we are on our way down. Waxing is up, waning is down. And by down, I mean from a full moon down to a new moon. And the Mayan Oracle, we're at a seven-tone day. Seven-tone is called the resonant tone of attunement. The kin for today, right in the middle here, is the human. And the guide for today is the seed. So today is called the resonant human guided by the seed. And then you have the supporting cast members. You've got the wind right here, which is the challenging energy for today, spirit listening to spirit. We have the like-minded energy today, which is the hand, which is all about accomplishment. And then we have the hidden power or the occult, which is the moon, our ability to nurture and, and purify ourselves. Now, hidden is, you know, occult is the word used for this particular position, the occult position. Occult is a word that just means that which is hidden. So when you hear people tell you that it means something evil and dark, they don't know what they're talking about. It just means that which is hidden. There's a lot of things that are hidden, and occult just means that. It doesn't mean anything more than that. So, all right, then you've got the uh, date for today, Wednesday the 8th, 2012. All right. So that is our cosmic weather. So that's what we're dealing with energetically today. So as we go out and about in the world, these are the good things. Now Mercury's back direct, which is good for the last couple of weeks. It's been it's been in the retrograde phase, which seems to slow things down in communication. But now we're moving forward. So onward. All right. This week, the theme at the beginning of the show, first, first story is 9-11. Yesterday was a piece on the psychology of not only 9-11, but the psychology of what is going on with people and how they respond. Fear, denial, these kind of things are what guide people along the way. And so today's piece is Loose Change, Final Cut, Part 1. If you've seen this, then this is a refresher. If you haven't seen this, this is one of the really good, good uh, series that's out there. So I would encourage you to watch the rest of this series. It's about an hour and a half long um, altogether. But this will give you a sample. Clip number one, part one, and explains a lot. Very well done. On September 11, 2006, thousands from all over the world gathered in New York City, New York. They wore black shirts, reading Investigate 9-11, and held banners that read, Ask Questions, Demand Answers. This day marked the fifth anniversary of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Although the 9-11 Commission report had been published over two years prior, Many Americans and citizens worldwide remained convinced that the truth was being withheld from the public. Why? Why was a growing percentage of the world population becoming increasingly skeptical of the events of September 11th? Was it a natural inclination towards believing the worst about the United States government? Or was it a legitimate concern that only grew more powerful with time? The 9-11 Truth Movement includes academics, engineers, physicists, firefighters, intelligence officials, and some of the very people whose lives have been shattered since September 11th. Were they all delirious? You should not be here. No, you got it all done. Or were they a concerned group of individuals 
taking the necessary steps to prevent the United States from slipping into its darkest era yet. Was September 11th a surprise attack on America by 19 Islamic terrorists? Or something else entirely? George Bush has spent an uncomfortable day with his people trying to explain away why he failed to pass on warnings the White House had received before September the 11th that terrorists were planning to hijack American aircraft. What happened that day has cast a shadow over just about every area of American life. Now one of the country's best known journalists has said that the American response, the so-called war on terrorism, has created a climate of effective censorship in a land claiming to be the home of free speech. There's never been an American war, small or large, in which access has been so limited as this one. The belief runs so strong in both the political and military leadership that those who control the images will control public opinion. Does it suggest that there was somebody uh, on the inside? He kind of kind of compared it to the Godfather story, you know, where the where the gun was placed in the in the men's room. There is also a possibility this could be some kind of inside job. May it have been uh, an inside job? Might these people have gotten help from the inside? I was speculating about that along with others early this morning, but now there's a lot more evidence that suggests it's almost certainly the case. It's an obscene comparison. I'm not sure I like it, but you know, there was a time in South Africa where people would put flaming tires around people's necks if they dissented. The fear is that you will, you will be necklaced here. You'll have a flaming tire of lack of patriotism put around your neck. Now, it's that fear that keeps journalists from asking the toughest of the tough questions and to continue to bore in on the tough questions so often. People let us stay out of our business. A country that hides something is a country that is uh, afraid of getting caught. And in particular, this Bush administration, uh, who is as tight with Saudi Arabia as you can get. I know the right question, but you know what? This is not exactly the right time to ask it. The president's father used to stay with the bin Laden family when he would go to Saudi Arabia. It starts with a feeling of patriotism within oneself. In the past, though, the FBI has sometimes made problems worse by ignoring or denying them. FBI management intentionally and repeatedly thwarted and obstructed my attempts to launch a more comprehensive investigation to identify and to neutralize terrorists. They realize what an entertainment-oriented society ours has become. To the families and victims of September 11th. On behalf of uh, John Vincent, Barry Carmody, and myself, we're sorry. And, you know, I want to say quietly, but as for soon as I can, that I hope this doesn't go any further. It's gone too far already. I, I am appalled by it. On September 13th, the United States government declares that it has overwhelming evidence that bin Laden is responsible for the attacks. The Taliban offers to hand over Osama bin Laden if the United States can provide evidence. Our position in this uh, regard is uh, that if America have uh, evidence and proofs, they should produce it and we are ready for the trial of Osama. Uh, bin Laden in the light of evidence. Are you willing to hand Osama bin Laden to the United States or not? No, no, no. no. With, without evidence, no. September 23rd, 2001. The, States. the Secretary of State said the administration would soon be able to document its case in public against the Al Qaeda network and Osama bin Laden. And I think it will be persuasive. By the next day, the White House was already backpedaling. But is there any plan to present? public evidence so that you know the average citizen not just americans but people all over the world 
can understand the case against well, Tamar. Well, I think as Secretary Powell said, you know, there, there's hope to do that uh, and to do so in a, in a timely fashion over some course of time. But I think the American people also understand that there are going to be times when that information cannot immediately be forthcoming, and the American people seem to be accepting of that. It seems as though you're asking everyone to trust you. This information has yet to be provided to the public. Instead of taking credit, bin Laden denies involvement in the attacks three times. December 13th, the Department of Defense releases a videotape allegedly discovered in a house in Jalalabad, Afghanistan. Osama bin Laden describes the attacks along with Khaled al Harbi. American mainstream media and even President Bush would portray this videotape as absolute proof of his guilt. International establishments question the authenticity of the tape. December 26, 2001. A Taliban official claims that he has attended the funeral of Osama bin Laden. The next day, a video believed to be recorded on November 19th is broadcast in which bin Laden praises the attack but takes no responsibility. The next bin Laden video would not appear until October 29, 2004, days before the presidential election. The video is described as the clearest claim of responsibility for 9-11. And when questioned why bin Laden's most wanted poster does not indict him for 9-11, the chief of investigative publicity for the FBI, Rex Toom, replied, 9-11 is not mentioned on bin Laden's most wanted poster is because the FBI has no hard evidence connecting Osama bin Laden to 9-11. Clearly, I, I couldn't really believe what I had just heard, so I repeated it, and he said, yes, that is correct. The FBI has no hard evidence connecting Osama bin Laden to 9-11. What evidence do they have? Two bags belonging to Mohammed Atta checked in at Portland Airport but failed to make Flight 11 at Boston, containing a 757 video tour and flight manual, an Arab-English dictionary, a handheld flight computer, a Quran, and his will. Why would Ada take his will onto a plane that would be destroyed in a fiery inferno? Marwan al shahis rental car, discovered at Logan Airport, containing an Arabic flight manual, an airport restricted area pass, and documents from Huffman Aviation. Nawaf al-Hazmi's rental car, discovered at Dulles Airport, containing Muhammad Atta's instructions, a check for a flight school in Phoenix, four drawings of a 757 cockpit, a knife, and maps of Washington and New York. Satam al-Sakami's passport, discovered below the Twin Towers. Well, Dan, not far from here, a passerby found the passport of one of the hijackers. How does a passport fly out of a man's pocket through a 400-mile-per-hour airplane crash? survive 9,000 gallons of jet fuel, and land intact on a sidewalk a thousand feet below. Mahed Maked and Nawaf al-Hazmi's ID cards discovered in the wreckage at the Pentagon. An ID, Saeed al-Ghamdi's passport, Ahmed al-Nami's driver's license, passport photos, This is the UFO News with Joshua Poet. All right, Dirk, thank you very much. Let's see what we have today. I got six stories. Here we go. All right, military like jets around UFO activity, says a Michigan witness. All right, this took place the other night, a couple nights ago. Self described C level executive for several large. Fortune 500 companies reports UFO activity over Michigan on August 6, 2012, according to testimony from the MUFON database. The UFO activity appeared to involve military display of jets. Some are UFO activity being or are some UFO activity being orchestrated so that witnesses can then file reports to show public apprehension. Dr. Carol Rosen suggests from consultation with the late Werner von Braun that at least some UFO activity is alleged psychological warfare by a military industrial complex. This complex allegedly seeks to orchestrate 
extraterrestrials as the next enemy in the aftermath of the war of earthbound terrorists. This complex apparently seeks to redirect public resources into military purposes in collusion with other capitalists. This is part of that Project Bluebeam that we talked about, the fourth phase. The alien threat, the last card is the alien invasion. Remember the video, she keeps saying that. All right, let's go look. Uh, we got a video slideshow here. Where is that? It's not it. That's not it. All right, here we go. We got the first one there. We've seen that kind before. All right. All right, and we got the triangle. So this is what we've got there. The link's available, so you can check it out. Make of it what you will. All right, this one comes to us from Fresno, California, on the 5th of August. This was amazing, it says. All right, that's a pretty good shot there. We've seen this kind. This is one of the... All right. He's coming from behind you. Very interesting. This is we've seen this kind, this orb like. Alright. Alright, that's the uh second one there and move right along. This here's a story from Jackson. Um it's uh Missouri UFOs in Jackson make news. August third, some are saying there are unexplained lights around the Jackson area. So far, people can't point to something like weather balloon or falling star or even a plane to explain it. Now they wonder, could it be related to incredible tales from Cape Girardeau dating back decades? Some say a bar of red and white lights was hovering recently above the homes in Jackson. People tell us they were mesmerized by beams and lights shooting from either end. Chris Clifton and others say the lighted craft showed up for at least five minutes twice over the week around the Bent Creek area of Jackson. Let's listen to what he has to say. Well, people say it's happening again. A variety of different unexplained lights in the sky popping up around Cape County. Could it be explained or is it something out of this world? Holly Brantley did some unusual investigating today. To find out, she joins us live. Holly, what did you learn? Jeff, at least half a dozen people contacted me personally to tell me about unexplained red and white lights around the Jackson area. Now, so far, they can't point to something like a weather balloon, a falling star, or even a plane to explain it. So that has them wondering, could this be related to incredible tales from the Cape Girardeau area dating back decades? A bar of red and white lights hovering above homes in Jackson. Well, I was pretty stunned. People tell us they were mesmerized by beams and light shooting from either end. I mean, hovering over the sky like that, you know, is one thing, but then when it starts shooting lights out. Chris Clifton and others say the lighted craft showed up for at least five minutes twice over the last week around the Bent Creek area of Jackson. And just take a look at this video from a Cape Girardeau apartment taken the last weekend in July. I don't know why that is such a busy area for identified flying objects. Recent sightings prompted Clifton yeah. and others to do some research, and they learned our area is no stranger to the unexplained. Now they wonder, could all these close encounters of the heartland kind be the product of something out of this world? I think a lot of people have probably have witnessed things. First, let's go all the way back to 1941, April in Cape Girardeau. Reverend William Huffman of Red Star Baptist Church gets a call about a plane crash and is asked to help. His granddaughter recalled the so-called family secret in this interview. You couldn't see those eyes and not be affected. A recreated picture is the most compelling part of her grandfather's story. There was no plane, instead a saucer, he says, with three alien bodies. Mann says her grandfather was sworn to secrecy. Through her own research, Mann discovered top secret declassified documents from archives in Washington, D.C., also detailing her grandfather's tale. I think it's arrogant to think that a God that we have that is so awesome 
created just us. Others in Piedmont also recall hundreds of sightings of lights in the sky from the early 70s, detailed in this old newspaper. Sightings past and present that give people like Clifton reason to look for answers. Because I had never seen anything like this before. Still looking for answers, I am told several members of local law enforcement also reported unexplained sightings over the past 10 years. Now, meanwhile, that crash of 1941, I'm told, continues to be researched today and is the subject of books and documentaries. All around the world, many UFO enthusiasts feel sightings are picking up. Live, local, late-breaking, Holly Brantley, Heartland News. All right, let's see our next story here. Let's go to... This one here, Australia or Arizona, excuse me. UFOs bolt from the sky in Tucson, Arizona. Once again, very hard to tell if this is legitimate, but it is only two minutes long and gets extremely interesting towards the end of the video. There was no meaning explanation accompanying this. All right, let's just see what we have here. And I'm probably just going to fast forward it to the end where it does get exciting. So. Set of lights up in the sky there, the triangle up in the clouds. Alright, look like uh, Alright, well, apparently the triangle in the clouds is doing some moving, so I'm going to leave the video. The video is there, it's linked, so you can check it out. I'm going to move on. This one is Texas. A dust storm and a witness takes a picture of the UFO. So you got one right there. Witness, UFO witness was standing on his second floor terrace when he captured a picture of a disc with a dome on top. So let's look at the full screen image here. There we go. That's the image that he was seeing. Yeah, you could see there's a little dome right there. Something. All right. Pretty interesting. What do you think that could be above the dust storm there? So he was standing on his... Okay, we saw that. Read that. All right. And the very last one here. Did the Maya have contact with UFOs and extraterrestrials? Well, of course, we've talked about that many, many a times. And this is new information about that. Um... Did Maya have contact with aliens? Many think so. This is a short educational film by Jason Kirby that shows how the Maya used to construct one period pyramid over another. At the sites at Calakamul, workers have discovered rooms inside the pyramid have never seen or been explored. Featured in this film are some of those newly discovered rooms plus some artifacts that have been in possession of the Mexican government for more than 80 years. These items ostensibly depict UFOs and alien life forms. Many will attempt to convince us that these relics and structures depict other events of everyday life of the Mayans, but common sense must prevail when the obvious is so clearly presented to us. So let me just play a little sample of what we've got right here. This is a 12-minute uh, piece. And through the course of this, they go through a number of these different artifacts. We've uh, had a number of these images on here before, so you can go back through the UFO links and, you know, remember all the pictures that we showed. There was the one picture which had the big sun and the triangle in it. You know, that was part of this collection. So, um, yeah, this is a good collection of all kind of recent stuff. So there you have it. That's our UFO news for today. I'll be right back. Responsible for some of the greatest crimes against this nation. Would you really want to know? These are big questions, but these questions deserve answers. It's time to demand the truth. Continue on here. Starting off, our next story, uh, Ron Paul. 
This is his weekly update, so let's listen to what he has to say. This is Ron Paul with your weekly update for August 6th. Last week, the House passed yet another bill placing sanctions on Iran and Syria, bringing us closer to another war in the Middle East. We are told that even harsher sanctions finally will force the targeted nations to bend to our will. Yet the effectiveness of previous sanctions teaches us nothing. In truth, sanctions lead to war more than they prevent war. Until last year, Libyan sanctions were touted as a great success story. The regime would change its behavior, yet NATO bombed the country anyway. Last week, we learned that President Obama signed an intelligence finding directing the CIA to covertly assist rebels in Syria. The administration seemed determined to fight yet another war in Syria that has nothing to do with American national interests. We already know that a similar finding was signed under the latest Bush administration directing U.S. intelligence to undermine the Iranian government and promote regime change there. Neoconservatives have long demanded that we overthrow the Syrian government before moving on to war against Iran. This bellicosity continues regardless of which party is in the White House. In Syria, we once again see how our interventionist policies backfire and make us less secure. Recent news reports point to ties between the Syrian opposition and al-Qaeda and other extremist groups. A recent article in The Guardian, a British newspaper, explained that, quote, al-Qaeda turns tide for rebels in battle for eastern Syria, close quote. The article quotes an al-Qaeda leader in Syria saying that he meets with the main U.S.-backed Syrian rebel organization, the Free Syrian Army, almost every day. So by promoting civil war in Syria, we end up fueling al-Qaeda. According to another recent press report, German intelligence services estimate that nearly 100 terrorist attacks have been committed by al-Qaeda or related organizations in Syria over the past six months. Last month, a suicide bomber in Syria killed a defense minister and several top government officials. The U.S. government, which has been fighting a war on terror for more than a decade now, refused to condemn that act of terrorism. This raises the question on whether the U.S. administration is supporting the same people in Syria that we have been fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton expressed these same concerns earlier this year when asked whether the U.S. has been reluctant to arm the Syrian rebels. She answered, to whom are we delivering them? We know al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting al-Qaeda in Syria? That's a very good question. It clearly demonstrates that the United States has no business at all being involved in the Syrian civil war. In the 1980s, we supported a resistance movement in Afghanistan that later gave birth to elements of al-Qaeda and the Taliban. When will we learn our lesson and stop intervening in conflicts we don't truly understand, conflicts that have nothing to do with American national interests. Thanks for calling. This written text of this update can be found on my website, www.house.gov slash Paul under the heading Texas Straight Talk. Thanks for calling. All right. And there you heard it is one of the reasons why the establishment doesn't really like Ron Paul. Because Ron Paul wants people to stop fighting wars. That seems to be a logical thing, right? I mean, how many of you out there want to go fight a war? I don't want to go fight a war. So if, and I'm guessing that the majority of us out here don't want to fight the war, then why do the leaders that lead us, why are they so warmongering? That's not representing what we want. So something's terribly wrong. And then when you have a candidate that is pushed aside because he doesn't want war. You know, what I don't understand is why the military brass, in light of all of the constitutional violations that are going on here, I don't understand why the military brass haven't stepped in and arrested the president for treason. 
I don't understand. So is the military beholden to somebody? Military brass? I'm not talking about all the soldiers and, you know, they're just there doing their job. I'm talking about the military brass who know better. Where are you? There's constitutional violations going on by the president and by Congress. Where are you, military brass? What happened? Is this 9-11? You're going to let us down again? Is this an inside job? Are you in on it too? I want to know, and I know that there's a lot of others in this country that want to know where you are too. So here's some thuggery that's taking place in regards to the Ron Paul and the GOP convention. The Republican National Committee continues to stir up controversy by attempting to strip Republican delegates of their credentials. Why would the RNC do that? How could it possibly benefit the party? Ben has the reality check you won't see anywhere else. A major development in the lead up to the Republican National Convention and the latest began just over a week ago. In the state of Maine, as we've told you, 21 of the 24 at-large delegates elected to represent the state's Republican Party do not support Governor Mitt Romney. They are Liberty delegates who support Congressman Ron Paul. Well, just over a week ago, 20 of those 21 Liberty delegates, plus another 20 alternates, everyone except for the governor of Maine, Paul LePage, received notice that the RNC has been asked to not seat their entire delegation. Now, the official notice came in a manila envelope each one mailed to each one of those delegates. But according to the postmark on the envelope, the notice didn't come from someone in Maine. Rather, it came from a 02109 zip code. It's one in Boston, the same zip code where the official Romney for President headquarters are located. Matt McDonald is one of those Maine delegates. There's a gentleman by the name of Peter Chinchette and a lady named Jan, Jan Staples, who is the National Committee woman from the state of Maine to the Republican Party. They're saying that the rules... Uh, at the convention of the Republicans of Maine back in May, uh, were broken. Uh, the credentials were not there. Uh, there was illegal votes. And so they're petitioning the RNC that we not be seated. Oh, but it gets better. This past weekend, those Liberty delegates received an offer of compromise from the RNC with five criteria. One, a majority of the delegates sign a statement agreeing that if Ron Paul is not on the ballot, they will vote at the convention for Mitt Romney. Two, instead of Brent Tweed, Charlie Webster, or Paul LePage would serve as the spokesperson for the delegation and announce the votes cast for president. That spokesperson, by the way, would also handle all media on behalf of the main delegation. Three, there is nothing negative said about Mitt Romney or positive said about President Obama especially to the media. Four, the delegation will be admitted to the convention and to all committee assignments without barrier. And five, the contest brought by Jan Staples and Peter Chinchette will be withdrawn. Well, today, the main delegation responded saying no deal to that so-called compromise. But there is another question here. Why would the Romney campaign, who seems to be having a very tough time finding their footing against President Obama, waste energy and resources fighting with a small number of Republican delegates? Well, that's what you need to know. The five-state rule. Under the RNC rules, in order for a candidate's name to go into nomination at the convention, they must have the support of a plurality of delegates from five states. Now, not win five states in the primary, but have support from a plurality of delegates. Congressman Paul has the plurality in Minnesota, Iowa, Nevada, Virginia, Maine, Oregon, and Louisiana. Seven states. Already the GOP in Louisiana are replacing delegates who are Paul supporters with Romney supporters. The same thing happened in Oregon, trying to knock those seven states down to just five. Remove the delegates from one of the five remaining states, like Maine, and the only name that can go into nomination at the Republican National Convention is Governor Romney. At this point, it's not about winning the nomination. It seems to be about the appearance of things, the appearance of unity. The appearance that Romney has the full support of conservatives, and yet he does not. That explains why, in the main compromise, delegates are asked not to speak to the media, to say nothing negative about Governor Romney and nothing positive about President Obama. It appears as though in order to create the appearance of a unified party, 
The RNC wants to not just bind delegates' votes, they're also attempting to bind their freedom of speech as well. And that is reality check. I mean, saying uh, nothing positive about Obama, that's not too difficult, is it? Because people don't really have a lot of positive things to say about him, right? All right. Now, speaking of Obama, look at this. Here, this is definitely not a positive thing. Obama fights ban on indefinite detention of Americans. See, this guy wants to put Americans in jail because he is not an American. The White House has filed an appeal in hopes of reversing a federal judge's ruling that bans the indefinite military detention of Americans because attorneys for the president say they are justified to imprison alleged terrorists without charge. Manhattan Federal Court Judge Catherine Forrest ruled in May that indefinite detention provisions signed into law late last year by U.S. President Barack Obama failed to pass constitutional muster in order to temporary injunction to keep the military from locking up any person, American or other, over allegations or terrorist ties. On Monday, however, federal prosecutors representing President Obama and Defense Secretary Leon Panetta filed a claim with the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in hopes of eliminating that ban. Ah, yes. Obama's our friend. Our friend. That's why he's doing this. There's some reason that he's benefiting the Americans by doing this. Must be. Because maybe if he rounds them all up and puts them in prison, then there could be a big, a big party or something, because we'd all be together. Like one big happy family. I don't know. I guess he wants to arrest Americans. Now, here we go. Classmate of Obama's. Obama Occidental Classmate Confirmed. Obama Scholarship. Obama Went by Barry. Bill Schneider Classmate. Obama Having Too Much Fun. Obama Occidental Classmate Confirmed. Why has Obama, since taking the White House, used Justice Department attorneys or taxpayer expense to avoid presenting a legitimate birth certificate and college records? Everyone called him Barry. Bill Schneider. Obama Occidental classmate. We were both scholarship students, Bill Snyder. So it goes on, and this is one piece because I'm going to click away from this over to the next one, and now we have information even further that talks about Obama and Indonesian roots. All right, let me play some of this piece here. I'm not going to play the whole thing, it's eight minutes long, but I'll, part of it. Here we go. The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. All right, so I got with Wayne Allen Root. Again, he's a guy who went to Columbia. He went to Columbia at the same time as President Obama went to Columbia. He's a guy who says he never saw this guy, never heard of him. He said he knew just about everybody who was in the graduating class of 1983. He says that uh, he didn't know of anybody named Barry Sotoro, didn't know of anybody named Barack Hussein Obama II. And... and um, of 400 people who graduated that year, I guess they were all called, and nobody remembered seeing Barack Obama. And he makes some allegations, and he says Mitt Romney's got to step up to the plate, and he's got to say something. He's got to challenge Barack Obama right now. Don't sit back and just be the whipping boy for for, for these allegations by Harry Reid and others. Just go right after Obama and say, all right, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Well, if you're desperate, first of all, hi, Joe. How are you? It's great to be on with you again. Let's Great to have that. you on, my friend. And it's great to be at the center of an interesting controversy because what I wrote made the front page of Drudge Report. It's there now. It's, of course, started on uh, Glenn's website, The Blaze. And I thank Glenn and all those people for, uh, for giving it its start. And the fire is spreading. It's gone viral. And TV and radio stations all over the country are calling, like, how about 12 a minute? <laughs> wow. No, 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 and, and you know what? It well deserved because it's very well written. And you are a guy that is above reproach. You, you can prove that you went to Columbia at the same time Barack Obama says he went, right? Well, how about this one? I can prove that I'm a businessman and I built my business. And the private sector isn't doing just fine. You didn't build and that. This is not a start in the right direction. You so didn't do that. So, so, so somebody, so, somebody, <laughs> somebody did that for you, Wayne. Come on. Listen. At the end way, of the, my, go ahead. Have you ever heard my answer to that? I think my answer is, is the best one, which is not just to be angry and say I built it. My answer is you're right, Mr. Obama. The uh, the infrastructure was built. The airports, the hospitals, the bridges. Uh, the education system, public schools, police, fire, national defense. But 
you need to thank us. We don't need to thank you. We, the business people, paid for it already. It was our payroll taxes. It was our workers' comp. It was our business taxes. It was our income taxes. It was our employees who we created their jobs and they paid taxes. That's how we paid for all your infrastructure. Therefore, you need to thank us. We've already done the work for you. It's Wayne Allen Root. Root for All right. So there you go. There is a little sample of that. So the link's available so you can listen to that. But come on, we got a president in office who has all kind of question about his background. And he's wanting to bring back into law reverse these bans on, you know, arresting Americans. It, it, I don't know. Some people are awake, and then it seems that there's a lot that aren't, you know? I mean, doesn't it boggle your mind every day? Come on, I know that it does. You go out there, and, and you must meet ten people who are just clueless about what's going on in the world. And you go through, and you just don't understand how they believe everything that they're told. I know, it's mind-boggling. If you figure out a way how to get through to these people, hey, you let me know. Because, you know, it's frustrating to me as it is to you. So hopefully everyone will wake up and we won't have to deal with that frustration. Now here is a message. This is uh, an important one found yesterday. And this is very concerned gentlemen. Time is up for everyone, he says. Listen to this. Well, I've been dreading the day that I'd have to make this video. And the reason I'm making this video is that thin veneer on our government has cracked. The Secretary for Agriculture has just released a report on food. And it's devastating. Obviously, considering how much crop's been gone. Now, for the next month, maybe two months, beef's going to get real, real cheap. But then most people won't be able to afford it after that. Buy it now, jerk it, salt it, put it away. On top of this, in conjunction with this report that was released by the Department of Agriculture head, I, I can't recall his name at the moment, I'm sorry. I, anyway, uh, there was a documentary released as well. This documentary is of the people that the governments of this planet go to when they need answers on the economy, energy, and food. They have broken their silence as well and have confirmed what all of the sheepdogs and all the preppers have been saying all along. We have very, very little time left, people. If you're going to be going to a location, now would probably be a good time to start making preparations to do so. I don't expect we're going to make it through the election. Uh, I've talked to many military, police, uh, friends of mine from service days. Everything is culminating this October, November. We have multiple reports from police in many different states. For instance, Missouri. They've been told to be ready for a major event in October, which is right about the right time frame. If you suspect yourself of being on one of these government lists, you best be out of Dodge before this happens. I don't plan on being here because I know they'll be coming after me. They don't like anyone with what's about to happen that believes in the Constitution and freedom. And we're going to have some hellacious tyranny soon and major, major food riots. But after that, the reckoning comes. And God help us. I would highly, highly recommend to everybody right now, finalize your preparations. Get ready to move. Time's up, guys. I'm going to put the link to the Department of Agriculture release below. And on that page, you can also link to the documentary and watch it yourself. It's confirmed all of our fears. And we're out of time, guys.
It's good luck and God be with you. All right, so here is this report that he is talking about. U.S. government warns high food prices to hit Americans hard. Now, you remember what all those floods were going on? And there was the talk that these floods were being engineered. As a matter of fact, the first flood that really took, that, that really became big, happened after the Army Corps of Engineers went up and they blew up that, uh, that levee. Where was it? Just south of Illinois, right? Birds Point. And, uh, and then there was all these floods that kept happening, and they blew up some other levees, and all the farmers had to leave their lands and because they were so flooded out. And then afterwards, remember the stories, the militaries were coming in, and, and the Army Corps of Engineers were offering to buy up these lands, this flooded land from the farmers for pennies on the dollar. There was something going on, a lot of talk about, uh, about something very bizarre about that. And now here we go. Here's the report. U.S. government warns high food prices to hit Americans hard. Nearly 60% of all U.S. farmland has now been devastated by the drought gripping the Midwest. As a result, according to U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Velasic, household grocery expenses are set to swell nationwide. Consumers are already paying record prices for beef, chicken, and pork, but corn prices are soaring. Two, up nearly 50% over the last six weeks as crops continue to shrivel in what is officially the largest U.S. drought on record. Wheat prices are also up 50%. A wet August would not improve the harvest or prices. And here we've got the uh, documentaries talking about. Let me tell you how long this is here. All right, well, I'm not going to go through that. <clears throat> anyway, um, the link's available so you can check it out. But something that we need to all pay attention to now military on the streets see all of these pieces are coming together and yet the military on the streets is starting to happen people are getting acclimated you've heard stories of different cities where they're patrolling well here's an article up at Infowars by Kurt Nimmo uh, the Army Reserve is taking to the road in Sheboygan County Wisconsin starting today until August 17th soldiers from the 102D military police company will be training on M117 armored security vehicles on the roads in the area all right so we got military out here um, earlier this year we reported deployment of similar vehicles in st. Louis and then uh, all right, so, and then we've had other reports. I know I remember some other that were out there. So, military's being prepared for something. We're hearing reports. Soldiers are getting told to be prepared. Here yesterday, check this out. This was a series of tanks moving through Burbank, California. All right, this train is moving south. These mountains here are east of the train, like northeast. This is, uh, let's see, I could tell you right where. Right there, this looks like this is uh, the Burbank Airport out in this area here. So it looks like, or this is Van Owen I'm here. So this, I think this is the Burbank Airport in this area here. So if you're looking to uh, kind of find a location, an area. And it would be heading out towards South Pendleton. All right. A lot of armored vehicles. What are they going to be used for? And the question that comes up is, are these painted the color that they should be painted? If they have just come back from the desert, or would they be painted a different color? So if they're not painted in desert camouflage then what uh, are they going to be painted are they being getting ready to sent out there or is... silly little questions I know silly little questions but questions nonetheless all right very last thing we're going to turn away from all of that now back into something positive I'm gonna do part eight Napoleon Hill I'm gonna play out the rest of uh, his stuff this over the course of this week and uh, I like the good positive info he gives. 
Let's check this out. Nothing important until we have enthusiasm. Now, Dr. Hill will explain how you can develop a feeling of enthusiasm for all that you do. Our eighth visit uh, brings us to the subject of enthusiasm, which may be likened to steam in a boiler, which, uh, when it is controlled and turned on, starts the wheels of machinery into action. Someone has said that knowledge is power. That is only a half-truth. For knowledge becomes power only when it is put into action for the attainment of a definite objective. Enthusiasm is one of the more powerful means by which we may put into action our education, experience, and knowledge. Spoken words without enthusiasm are often ineffective, and sometimes they can be actually boresome. As you, of course, know if you have uh, noticed the effect a speaker without enthusiasm has on his listeners. I have known lecturers to hold audiences spellbound for two hours, yet when members of the audience were asked to tell what the speaker had said, they could not remember. But what they did remember was that the speaker got their attention and held it. And now let me explain why enthusiasm has such a powerful impact upon the minds of those who come under its influence. To begin with, I believe you'll be interested in knowing that your brain and every other person's brain is both a broadcasting station and a receiving station which sends out thought vibrations and picks up those sent out by other people. When you turn on your enthusiasm, you step up the vibrations of thoughts which go out from your brain so that they reach and affect other people more quickly. As a matter of fact, you can send out thoughts which have been so stepped up with silent enthusiasm that they will reach and influence other people to whom you direct your thoughts. This is a fact which has been known to psychologists for ages, and it is also known to most master salesmen who use this method to condition the minds of their prospective buyers before they ever talk with them. You must have observed that the enthusiasm is very contagious, that it engages the attention of those who come under its influence and causes them to respond in a similar spirit of enthusiasm. I once heard Andrew Carnegie say that if you turn loose one man who thought in terms of intense enthusiasm in an industrial plant employing thousands of people, this man's enthusiasm would very quickly reach and influence every person in the plant. And he said that it made not the slightest difference whether the enthusiasm was negative or positive, constructive or destructive. Uh, then Mr. Carnegie went on to explain that in his selection of employees for promotion to bigger jobs, the first thing he looked for was a man's capacity to express himself in terms of intense enthusiasm. He said that enthusiasm is one of the most important traits necessary for leadership. The most successful lawyers are not necessarily those who know most about the legal profession, but they are those who know how to influence courts and juries with their belief in their cases and have a great capacity for expressing themselves with enthusiasm. Uh, when you are introduced to another person, you have a marvelous opportunity to sell yourself favorably to that person by the extent of the enthusiasm you express in accepting the introduction. When you shake hands with another person, you have also a fine opportunity to make a favorable impression by the warmth of enthusiasm you put into that handshake. If there is anything which leaves me flat and unfavorably impressed when I'm introduced, it's an extended hand which feels like a piece of cold ham and acknowledges the introduction with a cold, canned, pleased to meet you, with no signs of enthusiasm back of it. Now, right here, let me give you a brief course in salesmanship, which may be of value to you the remainder of your life. When you meet anyone on whom you wish to make a favorable impression, when it is a stranger you have not previously met, or someone with whom you are already acquainted, do these things. One... Turn on your enthusiasm and so modulate your voice with it that you definitely make the other person feel you are happy to communicate with him. Two, when you shake his hand, take a firm grip on it and give it a quick, firm squeeze at the end of each word you express in your greetings. For example, say, how do you do? I am so very glad to meet you. Uh, do not crush the hand, however, as I have uh, known some people to do. Three, and then, if you begin the conversation, be sure that you direct it to some subject of interest to the other person. And four, uh, follow through by eagerly asking questions which will keep attention focused upon the other person. 
Then, when you are ready to have the other person hear what you have to say about yourself or your interest or your business, he will have been prepared to listen attentively. I have often told my students of salesmanship that the best possible way for one to sell himself to others is to first sell the others to themselves. That counsel was sound when I began training salesmen over 30 years ago, and it is still sound. When I was a youngster in school, I discovered that the teachers from whom I learned the most were those who expressed the greatest enthusiasm in their teaching. And I have heard an experienced doctor say that the enthusiasm he carries into the sick room with him has more to do with helping to bring about a cure than all the medicine he can prescribe. Enthusiasm is an expression of a positive mental attitude, and it has long been known to doctors that a positive mental attitude stands high on the list of influences which uh, give one sound health. I have heard it said, for example, that only one thing causes stomach ulcers, and that is worry or a negative mental attitude. And only one thing can cure stomach ulcers, and that is a positive mental attitude. It seems that disease germs cannot live and thrive in the bloodstream of one whose mind is always positive. I have still another very important observation concerning the power of enthusiasm, which I wish to give you. I have observed that prayers expressed with intense enthusiasm uh, bring much uh, quicker and more satisfactory results. Now, you can try this for yourself and be convinced. I began experimenting with this idea many years ago, and from my experiences, I gathered the information which caused me to change my method of prayer entirely. I now use the prayer I recommended to you on previous visits with the gratifying results that I get quicker and more favorable action from my prayers than I did when I expressed them in a spirit which lacked enthusiasm. I suggest that a very practical way to begin learning to express yourself with enthusiasm will be to follow the habit of reading aloud for 10 minutes daily, putting all the enthusiasm at your command into your reading. Uh, you will be surprised in a short while at how much this will help you in speaking with enthusiasm in your ordinary conversations. I would suggest also that you adopt the habit of practicing enthusiasm in your conversations with your family and your business associates. Incidentally, this habit will make you more popular with those who are close to you. You can enjoy the benefits of enthusiasm. If you are interested enough to develop a technique by which to acquire this habit, so you will follow it in a natural, unaffected tone of voice. If you follow my suggestion that you read for 10 minutes daily as a means of uh, acquiring the habit of enthusiasm, I recommend that you write down a list of 10 subjects, things, or circumstances in which you have the keenest interest, and use this list for your practice purposes. You will have no difficulty in reading in a tone of enthusiasm in connection with the things that you like best. And finally, if you have not already picked up some useful ideas as to how the habit of enthusiasm can be developed or what causes one to be enthusiastic, let me give you an example which may provide you with an interesting cue. You perhaps remember when you were courting the person of your choice, or being courted as the case may be, you needed no one to tell you how or why to be enthusiastic. Of course not, because the motive of love or affection took care of this without effort on your part. Just remember that enthusiasm is always easily expressed when one is inspired by a burning desire for something or any motive associated with one's closest interests. Where there is no motive, there is apt to be no enthusiasm. Remember also that the three basic motives which it has been said practically rule the world are, one, the emotion of love, two, the emotion of sex, three, the desire for financial gain. A combination of all three of these motives, it has been claimed, can convert a mediocre person into a genius. And I leave the thought with you for consideration. And now, until our next visit, I ask that you try the habit of moving with enthusiasm in all of your daily work and see how much better you will feel. All right, excellent. Good advice again from Napoleon Hill. So let's, uh, that was part eight. I'll get to part nine tomorrow and ten Friday. So that brings us to our meditation for today. 
So go ahead and close your eyes. Relax. All right, for today's meditation, let's see, let's see, let's see. All right, I want you to imagine that you are walking down a path. And as you are walking down this path, you're looking around, observing life. And you see the problems of the world that exist. You see governments out of control. You see a police state growing. You see a media lying to the public. Politicians on the take. And a world gone mad where people are separated from their common sense. And as you walk and you observe this, you notice the clouds gather around you and it seems dark yet at this darkest moment you go inside and when you go inside your heart space when you sit into that in that place of love you remember something very important that in the end when all is said and done God is the victor good wins out and the darkness is destroyed and as you think this thought and remember this all of the negativity around you starts to fade away the corrupt politicians and personalities in life begin to lose their power The grasp that the police state has on the world begins to lose its control. And little by little, people become stronger. Stronger in mind, stronger in spirit, stronger in purpose. And in this strength, we find the common patriotism for the planet. And we bring good down to the planet because we allow good. And as we allow good, as has been written, good wins. So hold that thought in your mind, that memory, that good wins in the end. All we have to do is get through the moment from here to that point and if we stick together we'll all make it just a matter of faith now holding that idea of faith in your heart let's bring our energy and intention back to the present moment knowing that victory is assured three coming back to the present moment confidence about who you are and what you are doing. Two, coming back to the present moment, aware of the goodness within you available to shine into the world. And one, coming back to the present moment, happy, healthy, and whole. Happy, healthy, and whole. There you have it. That's the end of another show, Prayer Meditation. Thanks for being here. It's always a pleasure to get up each and every day and do the shows and interact throughout the course of the day with your emails and your comments. So thank you very much. I'll be back tomorrow with more news information. You have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon. Peace. I'm out of here.